Okay, let me actually start. Uh, I want to welcome uh, all our guests, uh, Professor Siva uh, Grobogi from Cornell University, Professor Benga Ogbe, uh, uh, Oge Degba uh, from uh, NYU, uh, who is a professor of health and medicine and chief division of health and behavior, and director center of the, of the uh, uh, for the health, uh, health, healthful behavior change in the Department of Population Health at the School of Medicine uh, at NYU uh, in New York University. Uh, Dr. Kovana, uh, just joining us now, he is the Director General uh, of the National Institute of Public Health in Conakry, uh, the Republic of, of Guinea. Uh, thank you to all of you. Uh, and I want to thank you for really taking the time. I know the three of you are very, very busy people working on books, research, but also taking care of one of the most important uh, issues and challenges that the world is facing, uh, either in your field, uh, Dr. Benga, or uh, Dr. Kobana in the field in uh, uh, Guinea. And I think that's not the first challenge that uh, you guys have, have faced head on and, and did your best with. Uh, so we welcome uh, everyone to this, uh, uh, the second in our series of webinars that focus on Africa and the challenge of COVID-19. Uh, uh, it is organized by the Africa Institute. For some of you who don't know, Africa Institute is a newly established institute. Uh, it's a postgraduate studies institute and it's also a think tank and uh, uh, a research institute. And it's based in Sharjah, UAE. Uh, and uh, it will be uh, up and running. We are, I mean, running now, but it will be up and running in a new building in 2023. It is uh, only will offer PhD, master's degree, and uh, diplomas in African languages, and, and of course, research and uh, archiving. Um, so this is the second in that series, and uh, the first series focused on East Africa. Uh, this one is focusing on West Africa uh, by two leading health uh, experts uh, who are actually hands on or doing research in the area. Let me introduce uh, my colleague uh, from Cornell University, Professor Siva Krovogi, who is a professor of international relations and political and legal thought at Cornell University. Uh, in the United States, of course. Uh, he's also uh, visiting Nelson Mandela Professor in the Department of Political and International Studies at the University of Rhodes in South Africa for the years 2020 and 2021. Uh, Siba is originally from Guinea. Uh, Siba's record of accomplishment are really many. It will probably take the whole time of the uh, webinar itself if I have to. Uh, mention all of them, but I would say few words in, in his field. He's one of the most respected in the field of uh, 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 international uh, relations and uh, international legal uh, uh, you know, uh, field. He published a lot of books uh, and I will just mention a few. He's the author of Sovereign, Quasi-Sovereign and Africans, Race and Self-Determination in International Law in 1996. He also published uh, a very well-known book that many of us use uh, for as text that is Beyond Eurocentrism and Anarchy, Memories of International Order and Institution. He's currently working uh, on completing manuscript on, I'm sure, uh, groundbreaking publications. One is The Gaze of Copernicus. There is Postcolonialism, Serendipity and the Making of the World and uh, other uh, uh, publication that he probably will tell us later on about. But let us uh, turn now into the, uh, the, the, the mic or the platform to my colleague who uh, gracefully agreed to lead this webinar, uh, that is uh, Professor uh, Gro uh, Siba Grobogi. So Siba, you take it from here on. I have to unmute. Thank you, Salah. Uh, Professor Hassan, um, my name is Siba Grovogi, as um, was uh, said earlier. Um, I am from Guinea, and I also taught at Johns Hopkins University for 19 years. That means two things. One, uh, just six years ago, we survived Ebola in Guinea, and two, 
I was on the academic council at Johns Hopkins and I got many, many, many hours discussing who medicine was for and who public health was for. Uh, for a long time, obviously, we imagined that public health was for populations at large and people who, uh, and in, in, in the provinces in Africa and elsewhere, and medicine was for people who actually could have access to doctors. And even here in Baltimore, where Johns Hopkins is, uh, medicine is really accessible to a few and public health is really, has been reduced for many years until COVID to surveillance of syphilis and other disease, venereal diseases in, in the neighborhoods of Baltimore. And so I'm very, very happy actually today to hear from two experts in the field uh, who will tell us about a bit about their background and then we'll go into talking about COVID, the challenges of COVID uh, from West Africa. I understand the first webinar was the challenges of COVID in, in, in North Africa. And, and today we are talking about West Africa. And the two people who are going to be Disc leading discussions today, thankfully, are people who are very accomplished in that field and are also very implicated in, 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 in combating the disease. Uh, Dr. Covenant Marcel has a PhD from Montreal. Uh, and in Guinea, he has been both teaching at the university that I know uh, in Conakry and also been involved in multiple, both. Uh, 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 the healing side of the med of medicine, but also research, which are done with many, many institutions, including WHO, uh, WHO and the London School of Tropical Medicine. Uh, Dr. Olubenga, of course, um, is, as has been said earlier, is professor uh, here at, uh, 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 at NYU in the US. And um, so what this, offers me uh, the hope that this the background and biographies offer me is that we both have will talk about this as um, scholars academics and etc but also as practitioners uh, uh, and 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 about what is happening on the ground in, in West Africa and so I'm very very thankful and I'm grateful that both of them are here uh, obviously uh, we may talk about other pandemics around the world and how they were dealt with, and, and we may well do that. But today we are really going to talk about what has been done to tackle the virus that we have upon us now, COVID-19. Uh, what are the responses? Uh, what are the challenges for African nations in particular? Um, uh, and I say in particular because the health infrastructure and the economic crisis of COVID in Africa uh, clearly do not resemble what they are in America where I'm sitting today and probably uh, in the Middle uh, East too. Uh, so we'll get to get here the answers to the questions uh, later on, but I just wanted both of them, beginning with uh, uh, Dr. Covena Marcel Lua, uh, 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 Covena Marcel Lua uh, to tell us briefly about his background and his connections to the pandemic and fighting it. And if you can do it in um, maybe under five minutes because we'll have questions later, I would appreciate that. Then I'll go to Dr. Rubenda. Yeah, thanks. Okay, uh, thank you, Professor Siba Grobogi. I'm Dr. Kovana Marcel uh, Basically my background is, uh, I did a pharmacist here in Guinea and then I moved to Canada where I'm student and I graduate in PhD and uh, medical school of uh, Montreal University. And then I did my postdoc at McGill University. And then I, in public health, and then I moved back in Guinea where I lead first the National Institute of Public Health for 10 years. And at the same time, I was the chairman of public health at the medical school from uh, 2005 to 2016. And then now currently I'm the focal point of CDC USA in Guinea uh, uh, on behalf of the Ministry of Health. So, uh, so I'm teaching I'm also a joint professor at uh, London School 
and Montreal University in public health. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Lua. Uh, then Professor Lugwenga Ogedigbe, please. Would you kindly just show us, point to us, if you jump in point for our questions later. Kindly, thanks. So in terms of saying what I do, is that the question? Yeah, yeah, and, and, yeah. and, and how what you do is related to the pandemic, please. Yeah, thank you so much for inviting me to join this session. Um, so by trade, um, I'm a primary care doc, I'm a physician scientist, and um, I lead a research program at NYU Grossman School of Medicine in New York City, that's New York University. But my primary job is actually to develop strategies implement them and disseminate them for reducing the burden of chronic diseases. In the past, and my work has been focused in the United States on reducing the racial gap in mortality between blacks and white as it relates to cardiovascular disease. In the past 10 years, I had expanded my work into global health. I served as advising for global health, inaugural advising for New York University College of Global Public Health. And currently, my role is limited to actually, we developed the first program to, to increase the number of African scientists that are doing research in non-communicable diseases. That's a research funded by Fogarty um, in the US. I've been doing that now for the past 12 years. And I've migrated my work very recently to begin to look at healthcare systems and how do we cultivate the training of people in Africa, really West Africa for the most part, Nigeria and Ghana, to begin to address um, the issues of our time, the rising burden of non-communicable diseases. With respect to COVID specifically, I've lost two dear friends to that. Professor Plandru, University of Ghana, may, may he rest in peace. May he rest in peace. Ghana. I didn't know you knew um, him. So we're very good friends. We've worked yeah. for 12 years on NIH funding. I just came back from Ghana March 1st. I go there four or five times a year and only to learn that Jacob passed away um, in, um, on, on, on Good Friday. And a close friend of mine also in Nigeria. So I've taken another stance in looking at how do we address issues of COVID um, um, on the continent. I'm working with a group in Nigeria where we're beginning to develop strategies that would allow us to look for alternative ways that we can address, if we ever need to, looks like we're getting there, the issue of breeding devices and how we can mitigate or circumvent, that we call our group circumvent, how we can circumvent the need for ventilators um, to manage acute respiratory failure, which is the hallmark of us causing the death in patients with COVID. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much. I want to go now to uh, Dr. Uh, Lua and, and ask him if he can tell us briefly about the measures that the government of Guinea has taken to tackle the spread of the virus. And if after that question, he can tell us briefly about how the population is responding to those measures. I would appreciate that. Thanks. Okay. Uh, thank you, Professor. Here, the first case of the COVID was discovered by on uh, March uh, 20, March uh, 12 this year. And then uh, the government based from so far, the government has adopted many measures to tackle the disease. Uh, but the, the, the research capacity, all those the research capacity is weak, but the, the measure they are taking is about surveillance, the surveillance and the response. The surveillance based on community, community health. Uh, we, the government has trained more than 10,000 people working at the ground, at the community level from the house world they saw, they contact people, they record the disease, and then they confirm case in the lab. 
And the, the, the lab confirmation is very uh, weak and it takes time. But uh, from that up now, I can say Guinea is one of the, I guess is among the five countries in Africa where the case is very high. But fortunately, the number of the disease, is, the, the death is very low. Uh, so far, we record 27 uh, deaths uh, among uh, almost 5,000 cases. Uh, at the community level, so the government has adopted uh, uh, the surveillance, the record, the record case, and the, the record contact case at the community level around the country uh, using the community health worker, and then they record the case and contact, and then uh, they try to confirm. And we have more than now 10 sites to manage the case in the country. Uh, but uh, we can say that as from Ebola, where we, we came from, the country, the surveillance system is, is weak compared to the other countries in West Africa. And then the challenge will be how we can revitalize our surveillance system. And then also uh, the, the government also set up a scientific community the, in charge of how to manage cases and what strategy can be implemented in, our, in the ground so that we can uh, tackle more cases and so that avoid to spread the disease. Uh, in now, we only have Conakry and few city, I can say five. Can, uh, Conakry is the capital. Yeah, Conakry is the capital where most, more than 70% uh, uh, of the case come from. And then the other are from Fria, the mining city, mining city, Kindia, Sigiri, and Pri. So uh, I will say, the government is making all his effort to, to tackle the disease. And this disease is managed by, since uh, Ebola time, by uh, a national agency of health security. We call that ANSS. ANSS has uh, a staff working at the top level, the Minister of Health, up to the village at the household how to tackle, uh, contact people, and how to diagnose and how to manage the disease. So uh, this is the strategy the government has adopted to tackle uh, Ebola, uh, sorry, to tackle the COVID-19. Uh, 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 we, we came from, we use our experience from Ebola. Uh, where Ebola come from in the West Africa and spread in the Sierra Leone and the Liberia. Uh, all the time, the total uh, case of Ebola was 3,018 cases, suspected, probable, and confirmed. Among them, 3,040 uh, 3, cases was confirmed and uh, nearly 2,500 uh, cases was dead. So uh, we, we are busy, uh, basing our experience based on Ebola disease. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to add briefly, because I'm also from Guinea, that uh, okay. one of the learning things we have to talk about in Guinea is um, that under Sekuture, the first president of Guinea, Every village in Guinea had a dispensary and it had a, yes. a nurse in them and et cetera. And that actually made the responses to a lot of diseases very quick, rapid, because the information went from there. And nowadays we are setting the structures, like is it the AN, a, 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 whatever it's called. Um, yeah, ANSS. ANSS is now coming, yes. from, it goes from above 
to below. And at some point, yeah. I actually want to, you to tell us about what those things have done because there are two different approaches. Seguture went from communal first and then up, and, and so information went from below to top, and now it seems to go in the other direction. And, and, yeah. and so Guinea is actually not only historically at the institutional level, but also because it has two major crises, Ebola and, and COVID. We may come to them. There's a lot of learning there to do about the medical strategies um, um, in relation to that. But before we go, we return to Guinea, I also, I also wanted to go to uh, uh, Professor. Okay, uh, yeah. Uh, okay, Digbe. Yes, actually, I can say that because I'm clearly, I can say, okay, okay Digbe. Um, if you can actually link up to what was said just now uh, in relation to either Nigeria or Ghana about the strategies adopted and how people are responding to them. Good question. Um, so the, I, I completely agree with um, Dr. Marcel, Dr. Loa, on the points he made. I think one thing we have to say very quickly, and he made that point very clearly, is that the experience from Ebola, which was, it, which was typical in West Africa, if you remember very clearly, um, that infrastructure, I think, my opinion, strictly my opinion, has allowed the African countries to actually respond um, much better. Now, we don't know. It looks like we're beginning to see more cases now in the early days when this hit Africa uh, mid-February, I believe it was the case in Nigeria, maybe Ghana. Um, we're beginning to see now more cases, but the, the rate of testing has not been adequate. So if you take a country like Guinea um, and you take a country like Nigeria, you're talking about a, a, a logarithmic, um, if you may, um, yeah. um, scope of the size, right? Yeah. Um, Nigeria has 190 million people. We have about 24,000 cases today. We have 500 deaths. Um, but the interesting thing is that a lot of the testing has not been what it should be. But in spite of that, if you look today in West Africa, some of the things I've looked up, it's almost like 10 countries account for 86% of the new cases, right, reported. And of those 10 countries, I think Nigeria, Cote d'Ivoire, Ghana, Cameroon, and Sudan actually make up. So that's a big deal. Um, seven countries are reporting fatality rates. That really means if somebody is affected, what is their chance of dying? Um, that are higher than what we're finding abroad, four to five percent. Chad, again, most of those seven countries are West Africa. Chad, Niger, Burkina Faso, Mali. And so if you throw in Angola and um, Algeria there, that's fine. Sudan actually is, is, is in West Africa. So I have to make those points because we've had a good job. We've done a good job of tracking tracing, isolating, and quarantine. We have a good coordination now with the African CDC. Dr. Lua can probably attest to this more than I can. Yes. Much better. I think again, Ebola made that happen. But I think though we're beginning to see a peak. The rate of deaths that we're seeing are those that we can report. In the Northern part of Nigeria, there's a recent report two weeks ago that showed a lot of unexplained deaths but it was so rapid. But now they've confirmed that half of those deaths are due to COVID. So the point I want to make there is that even though we've done a good job of testing, tracking, isolating, we need to start thinking about how do we make sure we increase the number of tests and how do we make sure that we have the resources necessary to coordinate care. So that I will stop there. I think I've said a lot that I didn't want to take away from how you want to moderate this. No, 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 no. Th thank you very much, Akhil. That's very good. Um, a few things jumped at me, and I'm going to start with you, and maybe go back mm -hmm. to to Dr. Lua. Um, big, uh, you know, the countries that you mentioned where where we find higher cases: Nigeria, Cote d'Ivoire, Ghana, and etc. They also they tend to be where obviously among the most in West Africa region uh, that have a larger economic base, yes, <clears throat> more urbanized, 
-hmm. and therefore could have the facilities to test. The countries where you have death, Niger, Burkina, Chad, are also of the poorest, <laughs> right? So my question is, first of all, what, what does the infrastructure do to how we deal with it? And if, if behavior alone can compensate for the lack of infrastructure, number one, right? And yeah. in Guinea, that may actually well be the case that after Ebola, people actually know what to do behavior-wise, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. right? But Niger, Burkina, and Mali are very poor countries, right? So that's one thing. Secondly, how do we know that we don't have more cases than we actually know about? Because, and now I go to, to Dr. Lua's comments, if you go to Guinea, Konaki, the capital, Fria, Sigri are places where we have mining, right? So they tend to have medical institutions. How reliable is that? And how does the, in the case of Guinea, how is this, the, the, this infrastructure, this national body that is monitoring this, how does you know that its data is actually reliable? Mm -hmm. So I start with you, Dr. Ogedegui first, and then I go to, to Dr. Lua. Let me quickly paraphrase your questions and please stop me if I'm wrong. And then that way, easier for me and Dr. Yes. Duarte to respond properly. Yes. Um, the first question is, you know, is, will behavior alone be sufficient in addressing this problem? And, and that question is in the context of the idea that if you look at where you have in most cases, it is in the economically vibrant um, countries. Yeah. If you look at where you have the case fatality rate that is high, it is in really poor um, countries. And the second question then becomes, how do, we, um, how do we make sure that we can, how reliable are the tests that we're getting? Um, uh, uh, did I capture- The data, the, not the test, the data. The, yeah. the, the data we're getting, good, the data. Yeah. So let, let me take the first one, because you made a very interesting that I didn't even think about. So in the early days, Cameroon, actually had the most tests. I used to be fascinated. Cameroon is a small country next to Nigeria. It's on the eastern part of Nigeria. Mm -hmm. It's the gateway we say to Central, Af Central Africa. Yeah. And so I look at Cameroon, they have 800 cases. I look at Nigeria, I'm from Lagos. I grew up in Lagos originally. I look at Nigeria and they have 200 cases. That didn't make sense to me at all. It turns out what they had in Cameroon was they had a better infrastructure in thinking rapidly about how to deploy tests. Dr. Lua has alluded to that in what is happening in Guinea. It took Nigeria time to catch up. We're simply in catch up. It's a vast, huge country. So I think that you're right. You know, economically, you have hospitals, you have more infrastructure, you can do more testing. In the poor countries, you don't have that. That becomes a problem. You're going to see delayed cases and people die and you don't know what to do. So you have high fatality rate because of the poor infrastructure. So the question of behavior and, you know, and, and whether or not it's infrastructure or behavior, I think the evidence is very clear, very clear everywhere, all over the world, that for COVID-19 behavior matters. We saw that with Ebola as well. The difference though, between Ebola and COVID is that the behavior we're talking about with Ebola was about protecting the self, mm -hmm. okay? And we don't have community spread. Dr. Lua can probably allude to this better and I can talk about this, which means the mere fact that I'm out there and I can spread the disease by the way I talk, it's not what we had with Ebola. So we're able to quickly shut Ebola down because of those behavior. In COVID, we can do the same and the same has been shown to work. Here's the challenge. In COVID, let's, I'm in New York City right now, we were hit, hit massively. I mean, we were in the midst of this all. In New York City, they shut down the city. Lagos, they shut down the city as well. Bear with me I make, as I make this analogy. Yeah. We brought it down. New York City is very dense, talking about 8, 10 million people in a tiny island. It's not a joke, it's a lot of people, right? Lagos is the same. Shut it down in New York City. I think we did the same in Lagos, but for a short period. The difference is this the 
kind of behavior required for COVID-19 means you don't go to work. The kind of behavior required for Ebola means I really need to wash my hands and make sure that I'm protected. I don't touch your body. I don't, I don't touch, touch your body. body. Yeah. Okay? In COVID, I don't even know what the body is. I don't know who has it, right? So if you don't go to work, you're talking about economic problems. And the economy of, of countries like Nigeria or most countries in West Africa is not strong enough to accommodate quarantine people without any means for survival. More so if you have to go out there to get that job. So I think on the short run, infrastructure is the least of the problem but behavior. On the long run, we're gonna to have to have a really solid way to be able to take those whom we find have infections, to be able to not only isolate them, but to provide services for them. The problem with isolation is that if you've been to Lagos, everybody lives on top of each other. And there's just it's difficult <laughs> to maintain social distancing. The good news for Africa or most of West Africa is 60% of the population is rural. So there's enough spacing in between. I think that's the challenge we have to think about as we think about these resources. Thank you. Um, one of the participants, Palevi Priti, has actually asked a question and I'm going to ask uh, he, uh, her, his or her question uh, to uh, Dr. Lua. Because actually, and it will be a way of responding, giving the same response you gave, but differently. Uh, and, and Dr. Lua, this is addressed to you. If you think of Ebola, and you think of the infrastructure for Ebola and the behavior that Ebola required, how has Ebola, dealing with Ebola, helped in facing COVID-19? And so I want you to comment both on the infrastructure and on the behavior, please. That's the question. Okay, uh, thank you. Unfortunately, my camera is not working properly. So, uh, thanks for the, the, the point that you raised. Um, the, we have two issues here. We have, uh, uh, we have a behavior problem and the infrastructure. But uh, Ebola, point out that the, the, the weakness of the health structure in, in the country, in West Africa, they have the same. Uh, but the main point was the surveillance system is very weak. When I talk about the surveillance system, I talk about the laboratory to detect and the system to get in touch with uh, the critical, the target population. Uh, with Ebola, what lead to the huge uh, spread of the disease? At the beginning, people, I mean the population, did not believe to the disease. They thought that was a political fake news. And then the staff, the staff, the medical staff think that it was only a medical problem. And then they miss, they miss the case. They miss the case because they said that, well, if you are sick of Ebola, we don't have any medication, you, you're going to die. They said that then the population that in that case, why should I go to the hospital? Because they don't have medication. They will not treat me. So they, they give up the modern medical to go to the, the, to the traditional healer. And then they start to spread the disease. That was the, that was the first point. So the behavior is very important when it's come to this kind of a situation. And the second point, it was at the beginning with Ebola, people said that before they discovered it was Ebola, they said that it's mysterious disease, mysterious disease, means for three, four months. At that point, the, the, the person, the sick person was 
uh, spreading the disease around the country and in the neighborhood. And then later, three months after, they discovered that it was Ebola because they took the sample and sent to Paris. So by the lack of the weakness of the health system, and then it's come to the economics. Yes, the economics is important because if you don't have good laboratory, if you don't have a uh, uh, good hospital, and then, uh, yes, you will increase the, the number of the lethality, I mean, the, the number of the death. But in the public health, in disease like this, you need to, to discover very soon so that your response can be quick. If you, if you, uh, you discover later, and then if you detect later, and then the response will come later, and because the response will come later, and then the, the later you come, the more you get the sickness, and then the more you have the percentage of the death is higher. Oh, yeah. in Guinea. Uh, after, after Ebola, uh, CDC Atlanta and WHO uh, evaluate the, the country level about the surveillance system. And they make four groups, four groups. The first group is where the surveillance system is very, very weak with major gaps in the governance, the laboratory, the detection, the disease detection, and so on. Among this, we have, with, uh, we have eight countries, uh, Mauritania, Guinea-Bissau, Gabon, Congo, uh, South Sudan, and, uh, and Equatorial Guinea. These are the eight countries where the surveillance was very, very weak up to now, based on the joint evaluation. Uh, and then the, the level two, the category two, are uh, 20 countries, where unfortunately my country is about. Among this, we have Mali, Ghana, Gambia, uh, no, not Ghana, I have Mali, Gambia, Gambia, Liberia, South Tome and Principe, Niger, Chad, Cameroon, uh, RDC, Kenya, Tanzania, Malawi, and Bosnia. And then the third level, I'm going to the bottom to the higher, the best one. And then the third one is a country category, we call that category three, with 10 countries. Among them, you have Algeria, Ethiopia, Nigeria, Cameroon, Ghana, Togo, and Ivory Coast. And the best country, the best, based on the surveillance system, you have nine countries. Among them, you have Senegalese, uh, Ghana, Uganda, Rwanda, Seychelles, uh, Mozambique. Uh, you have Jam Na Zambia, Mauritius, and Malawi. So, but you have this country, uh, the last one, the category four, is where the surveillance system is very, uh, very good, good practice. We call that uh, real-time surveillance. The real-time surveillance is that I detect a case in small uh, household, any part in the country, and at the same time, the, the top uh, government system, like in Guinea we call ANSS, uh, Agence Nationale de Sécurité Sanitaire or uh, National Health Security Agency, like CDC Guinea, uh, are soon at the same time, in a second, all people involved in the, the surveillance system are aware. This is very important because if you want to respond quickly, you, you need to detect and then because you detect, and then the decision between the detection and the response 
can go along. But if, if it takes time after you detect and then before you, uh, you respond and then you have problem. But I'm surprised why the best country still have uh, uh, more cases in, in Africa like uh, Ghana, uh, Senegal. I don't know what happened. Uh, in Guinea, the surveillance system and behavior. Here in Guinea, uh, in, spite, in spite of the effort of the government, the population are not using now, they don't believe the disease. They are not using the, the mask to protect their nose. Uh, they're not respecting the social distancing. And then it's what happened in, in Ivory Coast when they stop the social distanciation and the disease start to raise the case. Uh, yes, so we have to consider based on Ebola and now we have to consider, it's, yes, we need economics, but we have to consider uh, the behavior of the population and then also to strengthen our health system, I mean the surveillance system. Uh, case management is very important, but because our economics is very poor, so we need to work on the surveillance to strengthen the surveillance system and then work on how to manage the population so that uh, we can work on the behavior. Uh, Based on what happened in, in the world, you can see in German, why German has the lowest case in Europe, because they start to detect to everybody, even you are not sick. So that is, is facilitate to the isolation. But if we work only for case management, the capacity for the, office, for the hospital is very low, very limited. Uh, I will say that, yes, we need, in order we need to, the, to work on uh, behavior, we need to work on to strengthen the, the surveillance system. It's that one. Thank you. Yeah. Th thank you. Um... Thank you. Actually, um, I'm I'm really glad you brought up the the different. I mean, the um, movement from surveillance, detection, and case management. Yes. And 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 you sort of divided African countries along those axes in four categories. But what yes. I want to ask now is, and I start yeah. with you, and then I go to uh, to the next panelist. What is the role of the Africa CDC in this? Uh, A, in terms of best practices, how to tell each country what has worked in, in, in the other country best. And, okay. and secondly, yeah. no, it's a two question to that. First, okay. what is the role of the CDC Africa in, in, in sort of... Okay, uh, uh, in managing the disease. In, 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 in uh, passing it on information data and actually about best practices so that countries okay. learn from one another. Um, and the other one is um, uh, when in the field you are working, who is the authority first, uh, WHO or Africa CDC? Sorry, I'm sorry, I, I, I missed I'm, you. I'm, I'm asking because we are talking about how Africans de uh, capacity development, right? We have yes. an African CDC now. Yes. Right, and it seems that mm. the things that we are talking about about um, you know. Uh, People believe in, in, in multiple myths, population not believing in disease, and et cetera, which means that, that a public health institution in Africa, like the Africa CDC, has to deal with a lot more issues than, say, WHO will be aware of. So if WHO came, comes to you and Africa CDC comes to you, right, why is it important to listen to one and not the other? Or do you, do you or, or do the CDC work with the WHO work with the Africa CDC before the country, or WHO work directly with countries, and CDC, Africa CDC works directly with countries? How is that coordination? And, and what does that do to our capacity to confront the disease? 
Uh, thank you. I did. Uh, can you please uh, reformulate the second? I didn't hear that correctly because of no. I'm, I'm just uh, talking about um, you know you were raising questions and I can see how they are handled in America, for instance, right? And you cited Germany and a lot of European countries, right? Yeah. Where they have yeah. nationally they have their own CDCs, right? Yes. In Africa, yeah. we have the Africa CDC, right? Yeah. Yes. So I'm I'm talking about just information about public health. Okay. Right. What is the role of the Africa CDC? Okay. And is there ever a point? This is a question. Is there ever a, a time when you have to decide who to believe, Africa CDC or WHO, or who to take your orders from, or to who to follow? Does that does that come up? Is the question. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh, in Africa. CDC was created uh, after uh, Ebola because of the, the, the surveillance system, the health system was, was weak. And then uh, CDC was created and the headquarter in Addis Ababa. And then uh, in the West Africa, and CDC work closely with WHO. They are not working separately. They're supporting each other. And then, uh, provide the guideline, and CDC provide uh, field, field support to the country based on what uh, the, what was what is developed by WHO? So they're working. There is no uh, no conflict. They okay. work to support the country. They and both support the country when it come to help. And then CDC has is his regional sub regional subdivision. Uh, while uh, WHO has a country office. And then in, at the sub-region level in West Africa, CDC has uh, a CDC West Africa based in uh, Nigeria for all the country in West Africa. And then it's close to the country. It's, and then the meeting and the, the staff come from the country uh, where CDC West Africa is focused on. So we, you have CDC West Africa, CDC East Africa, CDC West Africa, and CDC uh, North Africa. Okay. So, uh, so uh, when it's come to the field, both work closely, even uh, working for guide country, they have a same meeting, not separate meeting. So okay and they provide the same tools and then CDC do one part and WHO give the guideline like at the global level. Uh, yes, uh, we have a, a WHO Afro who is the guide for our uh, health aspect in Africa. Okay. okay. Um... And uh, yes, I, I guess I will respond to both questions if I if I recall properly, or you can. No, no, no. no. I actually, I, 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 because we've been going on for a while, I actually want to go to to the co-panelists to see if there's a point where he wants to jump in here, because okay. you raised a lot of good questions about collaborations, about uh, you know, about uh, uh, intervention, about surveillance, about detection, mm -hmm. and etc. Et and I was wondering and, whether uh, there are some places where he wants to add because I want to go to, to him. Please. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Go ahead. The, the, I think, I think uh, Dr. Lua really gave us the origin and the history, but here's my take on this, if I may. I think it's important to understand that the hand that gives dictates. Mm -hmm. And that's, I think, is Ampati Amadu, or one of the philosophers, African philosophers that's, that say that. Yeah. Yes. So the role of the role of WHO and CDC, I think it's time that African governments 
we begin to understand the role that they play. And I think the African CDC, I have to say, has taken a more proactive role in how it is beginning to respond to these issues. Now, we've only had, thank God that we've only had COVID post Ebola when CDC was formed in Africa. There's more coordination and they're led by Africans. That's the important thing to appreciate here. The WHO is a technical partner. And I don't know why people don't appreciate this enough. They are a technical partner. They don't dictate and shouldn't dictate what countries do. And to the extent that African countries can begin to appreciate this fact, it's gonna be very important. Um, so yeah. to your question about, you know, who should take a lead? The local governments should take a lead. This is what yes. the state of Lagos did during Ebola. Lagos State took the lead with Dr. Yep. Idris, you know, Jide Idris said, look, we're gonna take the lead. That is it. Of course, what we put in place was exactly what we're using now as infrastructure to set up the treatment centers in Nigeria for COVID. So I think partnership matters, but African countries have to start taking the lead because the hand that gives dictates and is always on top. So yes. it, until we begin to appreciate that, it's, we're gonna keep looking outwardly for the support that we need to solve a problem that we have to solve at home. And Chinua Achebe, make a last point, said, you don't want to, you, you, you should not enter your house through the no. gate of another person's house. Yes. And the idea there just means all politics are local. You've got to have contextualized strategies and solutions to problems. Um, COVID-19 is a pandemic, but the solutions are different as you begin to see. The treatment, we know what to do. We know the behaviors to adopt, but the way you implement them and execute them is different in different countries. Dr. Lala talked yes. about Germany. Um, so that, I think that's, that, I, I think, I don't know that WHO should dictate. I think African CDC, which has, each country has their own CDC now, Nigeria has one, will have to make that dictation in collaboration with the federal government. Nigerian government, we have something called the Presidential Task Force for COVID. And that task force meets every Monday morning. The CDC is part of the team. They come with treatment guidelines. The task force though is really grounded by folks from the Ministry of Health and the healthcare sector. So that way there's some level of coordination at the government level. Okay. Um, um, somebody, as you were, you, 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 you were talking, somebody actually, you were talking about the hand that gives. Right, and the hand that takes yeah. is, is below always, right? Mm -hmm. And so the question that just came to me is, as a public health person, both for the ethics and in relation to, to the infrastructure, what do you think about the idea coming out of France and now Britain that the vaccine should be first tested in Africa? And, and there are two questions there. One is, of course, that... that <clears throat> Right, Africa doesn't have infrastructure, and there's we and 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 and, and, and Dr. Kovana Lua was talking about the cases management. We don't have hospitals to manage the case, so it stands to reason that we should actually have the test in Africa because mm -hmm. then they don't have to go to hospital. But the other question is, right, is historical. Yeah. Why must Africa be the place where we test unproven vaccines? And I just want to have your opinion on it, beginning sure. with you, uh, sure. and, and then I'll go to, to uh, Ogadewe, and, and then I'll go to Boa, please. So I, I'm, an, I'm African, so my answers often have to be prefaced with history yes. and proverbs. Yeah. Um, but I won't go into proverbs. Let me go into history. The history of global health is very colonial. In the early days, even the definition of global health is colonial. In the early days, Global health was restricted to diseases that affect the colonial Europeans who came to Africa. You mean public health? And that was with associative hygiene. Hygiene. We, and, it, no, it no. As public but, health and but, hygiene. Because yeah, it was, and, yeah. And that's what they called it. And then yeah. it became, we're going to look at tuberculosis. Yeah. And it moved to STDs. We're going to look at malaria. 
at the end of the day, the people that tuberculosis and malaria were killing were the Europeans. It, it really wasn't Africans, okay? Um, and so the, the nature and the flow of resources was grounded in that. The London School of Hygiene and Public Health was not created for the good of Africans. Let's not get ourselves mixed up here about this. Um, I talked not to here in the US. It was not, not created it for poor. It was, for it was created to actually be able to help the Europeans mm -hmm. um, in their quest to, to advance science and advance. And if you look at the science is advanced, and this is not to say this is intentional. I'm not trying to assign blame here. I'm no, in the no. Western region right now. But I think you have to understand that history well. Then that evolved and then came HIV. And this same question you're asking now is the same question that was asked at the time, okay? Let me try and give you my own, my own answer to that. I think we, we should not be too cynical to be able to throw away the baby and the dirty bath water out. Yes. The reason COVID is particularly important, I think we learned a lesson from Ebola. There was no, that's not true. There weren't any systematic way to conduct clinical trials as Ebola was evolving. We were all caught up in what was happening on ground, okay? Some trials were conducted, but not as much as we see with COVID-19 cases. But Ebola was not a pandemic either. It was an epidemic constrained to a particular part of Africa. Um, I had a colleague telling me, he just came back from Ghana. Oh, what about Namibia? I'm like, Namibia is too far. <laughs> this disease is, is really, well. even in West Africa, we could name the countries that were affected, okay? Mm -hmm. So COVID though is a different story. You have a curve. It gets really worse. It gets to the peak. And then based on what, how well you do, it begins to taper off. The reason I think we're hearing a lot, and I need to look at those, those information very well, we're hearing a lot about vaccine trials in Africa is because I think the, the, the curve in Africa is only beginning to accelerate now. To do a vaccine trial, you've got to have susceptible hosts, you've got to have the vaccine itself, and you've got to be able to say you have the disease. Um, that, and then to be able to show that in those who are exposed, this thing will prevent the disease in them. So the problem is that, the, so the issue is that, yes, if we look at the curve, it's almost, it's in, it's in the US, vaccine trials are going on here too. Let's not get it wrong. But, it but, but may, they are volunteers. In the UK and the US, they are volunteers. I, I think they should be volunteers in Africa as well. I don't think there should be a mandatory vaccine in Africa. Everybody should kick against that. That's the point I was gonna to come to. Because okay. it's a pandemic, I think the Africa CDC should come up with guidelines on exactly how we want to see this happen and where. But to do that, you've got to address the issue of colonialism. And you've got to address the history. To do a vaccine trial, one of my colleagues, he leads our, our bioethics division here, very well known, Dr. Art Kaplan will say, what is the benefit to that population? Okay, what is the risk to that population? And where is the social justice? Uh, should they bear the brunt of this? And if they do, how will this benefit them? Those are questions we have to address. And Africa CDC and the AU, frankly, must play a huge role in this. They cannot roll over. They can't. They have to be addressed. It's got to be voluntary. If it's voluntary here, it must be voluntary over there. We should not well, forget. But, yeah, yeah, actually, just to, to, to just nudge you on a bit, uh, mm -hmm. the, the question, your last question was talking about ethics, mm -hmm. right? Is how beneficial is going to be to them once we have the vaccine? Is yes. the vaccine going to, but this, because these are pharmaceuticals and they are private corporations. Yeah. If the tests are done in Africa, is there an obligation actually to provide to Africans who may not have the money to get the vaccine later. They don't have the money, not that we may not. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's the question. I, I'm always, well, I, I'm in academia, in my field of work, uh, I've, I've been funded mostly by the federal government. Um, yeah. Really, I can't even count how many grants I have from, from pharma. 
pharmaceutical industries have one mandate. Profit. Profit and the shareholders. Yep. Public good is a side effect of that. It's nothing wrong with that. That's the whole point of how people try. But the ethics and the regulation, they help to address those issues. I think the AU, the CDC must come up with standard negotiation that makes it clear that if it is developed here and it works, then there must be clearly commitment, not just in writing, commitment that any time that vaccine is needed, which it will be on the continent, the price has to drop to yeah. levels that are affordable for those countries. They've done that with ivermectin, which is the one yeah. for river blindness. We knew what yeah. happened. Yeah. HIV drugs, well, the same thing happened. Yep. I mean, something years ago, they found the treatment. How are you going to pay $10,000 a year for HIV medications? <laughs> it was because there was no rule in place, but yep. they caved. I think that's how we have to look at this. Yeah. I, I won't do, say no, but there has to be a rule on do, how they do, 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 Dr. Lua, yes. uh, if, since you are in the field and you work for, for, for the bureaucracies in Guinea that deal with this, if somebody were to come to you and tell you that Africans should be available to do, to test the vaccine. How would yes. you think about that? And how would you go about doing that? First, what uh, do you think about that question and, and how would you handle it? Well, uh, in order to be, because I'm, uh, my background is pharmacies and I did also pharmacology and toxicology in Canada. And I know the role of drug to be approved in Japan, around the world. I will, I will say yes. We we have to accept that. And I know, I know what was the frustration for most of the Africa is based on the colonial. Uh, you should think about the colonial. When I took my first course of epidemiology in Montreal. Uh, the first drug to, to track uh, syphilis, TB, they came, the drug company came to the black uh, America. Yes. And, and Tuskegee, they, the Tuskegee, Tuskegee experiment, yeah. And then they infect them, they infect first, and then they try to find the best drug to, 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 to manage that. And then it was not, at that time, there was not uh, 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 the ethic. The ethic was not strong. It was not, it's, it's based that after they start to strengthen the ethic aspect. Yeah, but what I'm today, asking is what would you ask? Today, them? if what we don't ask, okay. yeah. accept, if we don't accept to develop, to do the clinical, trial, if this, we're talking about the, the immunologic aspect. The vaccine is based on the strain of the virus or the microbes. And the, the strain of the virus of, uh, and the virus or microbe is not the same in Europe as in Africa. Who, and then, um, uh, I was one year. Uh, you know, I, I don't mean to interrupt you, but what I wanted to ask actually is to go back to, to the question, which is, yeah. you, you actually alluded to it. You said trial. You know? Yes. Right. Yeah. If somebody comes, yeah. would Johns Hopkins do the trials as we do everywhere? Or sh do you do the trials in Guinea? How do you operationalize that? It's not whether, uh, because the question was answered earlier about the ethics. How would you operationalize that? Would you be, well, right? You, because the question to raise is, 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 is not just that the vaccine will be tried in Africa. It is what yeah. role do we have to play okay. in that if we wanted yeah. to? Who, right? The trials themselves, is it going to be conducted by Johns Hopkins? Right? Or is it or the CDC or, or, or Boston University? Or is it going to be by you? And how would you operationalize that? If you were to well, go? we now in the country, we have a strong AC committee and then the, the scientific the scientific uh, uh, expert will work uh, in the bipartisanship around the world. It's not isolated. 
uh, operational resource only for Guinea. It has to be uh, a partner around the world, including Guinean partner. And then they set up, they set up uh, ethic committee. They approve the protocol in uh, Europe. And also the same protocol has to be submitted to the ethic committee in Guinea and approve that. And then the ethic committee has big training. They have good style. They have been trained the same model, the same courses, the same practice. Then they can they can uh, monitor, and then we will work. If somebody come to me, uh, I will work with in partner with Ghanaian or something in Europe, and then the protocol will be submitted uh, in uh, in uh, Europe, and then will be. Okay. Um... Okay, I, I think I should, I, I, should, I should go to you and, and ask sure. the, the following question because we're talking about, you, you are saying that it's not just a question of accepting or not accepting, right? You, should, you were saying fighting against cynicism. But fighting against cynicism is actually change how we work with other people and, and what role do we play in them? Are we actually fitted in Africa today to play such a central role in a vaccine trial such that we learn both from the process mm -hmm. and that we become partners, not just subjects? Yeah. I right. think, yeah, I, 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 in fact, here's the good news. The good news is that we have competent African scientists in Africa today who can lead vaccine trials. Competent, emphasis on the word competent. Mm. We have also the other good news. We now have, we've always had, but we now have even more robust facilities to do that. So if you look at the Gambia, okay, they have what they will call the Medical Research Center. Pretty solid one. Mm -hmm. There's one in Kenya. Um, there's one in Nigeria. Yes. Um, there's okay. one in Ghana. And- Okay. No, come on, Ajia, at, wait, wait first. Now let, let finish with this thought. They Please wait. Okay. okay. They have one in Guinea. If we're going to have a vaccine trial, it cannot be what happened in the northern part of Nigeria with Pfizer. With Pfizer, where yeah. They came That's what I was going to think about. It yeah. was a problem, um, not just on the ethical level, but also on the so called, what you would call participatory aspect of this. My mantra yes. is that any clinical trial, has to be conducted, whether it is vaccine or any other thing, has to be conducted in a participatory manner. And we're beginning to see that now. I sit on the council of Fogarty Institute at the NIH. A lot of the proposals are coming out are beginning to say, we want African principal investigators. Why? Because that's the only way you can build institutional capacity. capacity. And so really? the reason yes. I say we, we, we have to temper our cynicism is that, yes, we must be cynical and avidly so of anything that comes into Africa, be it science, education, what have you. But we must also remember that when we have such opportunities, we have to have very clear sense and we have to be clear eyed about the role that the African institution will play in that regard. To me, there has to be a procedure in place to say this. There's something called the EDCTP. Um, I think is the European Development Clinical Trial uh, Program. Maybe I'm saying this wrong. I was at the EU once, yeah, yeah, the EU research program once, and I met the director. It's hundreds, maybe tens of hundreds of, 10, $60 million or something, like euros. Or something. I said, how do you get that kind of money? How many African institutions are in that? He said, well, he gave me the number. I said, how did you reach out to them? The chap just looked at me. They reached out. I said, I don't understand. Who leads these programs? Are they Africans? And, you know, it began to emerge that that was put together by the Europeans, which is okay, 
But Africans are not at the table because Africans just don't want to be at the table the way they could be. And the reason for that is that we're often told we're not good enough. So at some point, I really think that, you know, it's important or the small successes we're seeing, we've got to tout it. So it's important to have a protocol that, that talks about how you, how you engage and how you negotiate this. Um, so all I'm saying is that, yes, we can do it, but it's got to be that what is in this for Africa, who's going to take a lead on it and who's going to get the credit for it, if it happens. And, 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 and one, of, one more question is, and I want you to, to, to answer that question is, uh, why hasn't Africa, since we have the CDC and therefore it's not just country by country, the whole continent, why hasn't Africa, or has Africa, actually should be the question, has Africa invested itself in finding a vaccine for this? Let me go first, and then I'll leave it to Dr. Lua, who is a vaccinologist or yes. pharmacist. Or he, he has, that's above my privilege. Let me go first. Here's why. The reason is because Africans did not define the problem. Let me say it again. Yes. Africans did not define, we don't define these problems. Yeah. We wait for it to be defined in Europe, in America, in North America, in Canada, Japan, wherever, and then brought to Africa. Folks, here's the problem you have. Until you define a problem, you don't own that problem. Ebola was not defined by Africans either. COVID, Africans haven't defined that either. I remember very clearly what presidents, the president of Ghana said when he was hosting the French president. And he made it very clear, Africa must do its own thing. Yes, we need your money, but we need to decide what we want to do with that money. We haven't defined that problem. That is why we're not owning this problem. Until we begin to own it, it begins to make sense. The hand that dictates, that gives, truly dictates. Yeah. And I think everything has to start from there. There has to be a renegotiation of who owns the problem. And that, that requires us to do our training in a radically different way. The training program we have in Ghana, we've not included Nigeria, we bring 20 professors every year to Ghana. And we ask the trainees to define the problem. We're not going to, my job is to link you with the people that can help you think about the problem. My job is not to define, because if I define it for you, that's my problem. Then the solution will come from you. It will come from me, exactly. Yep. Yep. <clears throat> Dr. Lua, please jump in here. Yeah. Sorry, we love Okay. Jump in here. The, the, the question is. Okay. Why hasn't Africa as a continent invested in vaccine and what will it take for us to do that? Uh, thank you. Uh, it's, it's long way. Um, as an expert for WHO in uh, uh, three years back, uh, this question was raised. Uh, most of the drugs are developed in, in Europe. And when we ask the country to develop a factory so that we can develop our own product, they said in most country, most of the country, that was, this is too ambitious. This will be more costly. We don't have money. And then it's easier to, to take money always factored from Europe to Africa. And also our education system has to be changed drastically. If that happened in South Korea, we have to change our education system by uh, training people how to solve problem. Not uh, here the system, if I want to do something, I have to go in London and learn there how to do them. And then when I ask to implement a good laboratory, they will ask me, well, we don't have money, it's good to go somewhere else. Uh, we can do that if have, have to be that, as my colleague said, that 
we have to design we have to design what we want but we are not designing we are accompanying others to do that we can do that and we have to do that uh, we need uh, today is 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 uh, is not complicated we need a good protocol it's participation with uh, between africa and then we can do that but as long as we think that we need something in Europe to lead, then uh, we will not be the one to respond to that question. So yes, we can do that. Africa can do that if there are, they have a strong will to uh, fund, uh, uh, to fund a research group, to develop a research group. Is that the World Bank? has started to develop in in some countries they call that african center of excellence in africa center of excellence you have to you have to select something that that is important for at the regional level like a clinical trial like uh, developing a new drug like uh, uh, developing a lab base or any clinical approach to treat, detect all. So we can do that, not today, but in five years, if we have a strong will, with political will, we can do that. It's possible. Because now, today, we have so many experts. They are working, brain, brain draining. They are working, they are working abroad in Europe. Most of them are working in Europe, in the USA because they don't like capacity, they don't have capacity in their country. If, if that possible, we can do that. Africa can develop clinical trial. Yes. So can, can, I, can so, I disagree with Dr. Lua briefly? On yeah, just yeah, one wait, actually, this is a discussion. Yeah. This is a discussion. I, I like this a lot. Yeah. I think the notion that Africans are not ready and I did not, that's not what Dr. Loa said, but it, 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 it goes to that point. It's just blatantly wrong. No country is ever ready when they begin a journey. What we need to focus on as Africans, and when I think about African institutions, and I've been guilty of this too, because I've been here for 30 years now, is I think about what is that process and that journey going to look like? We've got to get away from the mentality, when I use we now, meaning the African nations, yeah. our scientists at home, from the mentality that we're not ready. And that's yes. what they keep telling you. So you put in a proposal and they tell you it's too ambitious. Yeah. And yes. then you come back and say, yeah, we're not ready. We don't have, to. every time I go to teach in Ghana and Nigeria, they say, hey, prof, you know, we don't have anything here. And I just laughed. Yes. I said, it is yes. true that you don't have infrastructure, but the government right now pays your salary. The government does not pay my salary in the US. I still have to develop my group and I have to give my institution return on investment. Prof, you know that yourself, <laughs> uh, where you are. So the notion that you need to have everything to deliver doesn't make sense. And then we need to have a mind, a change in the mindset. That mindset is too colonial. We are never good at, we're never ready for any ambitious project. And when we do it, say, you see, they failed. They don't focus on the success. Every vaccine trial, every drug has a million failures. Nobody talks about those failures. You talk about that success. That mindset has to change. I yep. think. That's, that, that's a new way. Thank, thank you, actually. And I wanted to, to add to your point as a segue to actually think about what have we learned about this pandemic and how to think about what happens later in terms of taking charge of ourselves, right? And, and, and when the list was being read about the countries that are trailing where mortality is, is very high, I noticed that there were a lot of Francophone African countries on it. And Malawi was not on there. Right, they are equally smaller countries in Southern Africa and who are English speaking, right? And actually, thinks about 
certain ways our ties to European countries, especially in Francophone Africa, are not always the healthiest, that we always take mm -hmm. the lead. And, and you see that in, in the CFA thing and et cetera, et cetera. And, and we actually have to talk about, talk about that openly. Um, and, and, and so I'm glad you brought those things up, but I'm just going to leave that there and, and ask you to, to tell, to, to, since we are drawing toward the end, to what, what now? What have we learned about the pandemic? What does that tell about our successes in the future about public, in public health, in the health of our population? And if you care about development in general, Success, so I start with you. yeah, okay. So what have we learned? I think we've learned a lot about the pandemic. And if I tell you, I'm in the US here, um, I'm in New York City. And what we've learned in New York City, you see why it's relevant in a second, is that the epidemic is ravaging black people at a much higher rate than white folks. The epidemic is laying bare the structural aspects of racism and the structural inequity in health that most of us knew and we know and we've known when we do work in this space, but nothing makes it even more stark as we're seeing it now. Access to care, living in poor neighborhoods, having low wage jobs that actually push you at more risk and then not really having good quality care in the setting. Overlaid on top of that is the cynicism and the misperception of the disease itself in those same black communities. Yeah. So we're seeing that. If you transport that to Africa, same thing. To the ones you just said now. We're beginning to see what we've known for a very long time, which is Africans' poor health infrastructure. Look, I've been here since I was born. We have, I'm 57 years old today, but we haven't done much about that. Why has nothing changed? I think if the epidemic, I pray to God that we don't hit the peak, as I were able to flatten this off quickly. Yeah. <laughs> if the epidemic hits the way it hit us here in the US, it's going to lay to bear the issues around what we already know about poor health infrastructure. Because we've learned that here, I'm hoping that we begin at the very least, similar to what we did with Ebola, we begin to take the idea of contact tracing, isolation, and all of that very seriously. Put structures in place that can allow us to test. Really begin to create tests. I think Senegal is doing that um, in our own countries without relying on tests from WHO. Leapfrog that. That's what we've learned. We've learned a lot about disease and what we need to do. The successes I see is, you know, it is in crisis that you have this, they say character is born out of adversity. So it is in crisis like this that you see a whole lot of innovation. Telemedicine as we know it today in, in, in the US has ballooned. We're now on Zoom. Ordinarily, we won't do this. We'll find a place to convene, right? I think, though, the successes in Africa would be that we would have had another coordination experience around infectious disease through Africa CDC. But what I hope we're going to see with the success is we're going to have laboratories that are beginning to do their own tests in Africa so we can make it available at a cheaper cost. There's nothing fancy about those tests to be able to make them in Africa. So hopefully our labs, through the CDC, of course, can have more capacity to do that. What do I hope for development is along those same lines. I hope that with the pandemic, I think it's Zeke Emanuel, the chief of staff of Obama, became mayor of Chicago, said, no crisis should be wasted. This is a crisis that we cannot afford to waste. We've got to figure out a way to build a capacity of the next generation of innovative health workers, not doctors, not nurses, regular citizens who can be able to do very simple testing, contact tracing, tracking, and ability to isolate because we have 
such strong culture that can allow us to leverage that. That's what I'm hoping is gonna happen. In addition, of course, to the um, capacity of building labs that can allow us to do these tests. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Lua, please. Okay, thank you. I will just, I will just some few point on what my colleague just said. I will not repeat them. Uh, in addition to what he said, is that in uh, Africa, what we have learned is that uh, the behavior is very important. If we want to manage, we learn that behavior is very important. It's uh, something that we can work on because um, people do not, most of the people do not believe that the disease is real. So most of the them think that the disease is real. I know in a city like Koya, they don't, they refuse to use a mask. There is no mask. Anybody is not using a mask in Koya because they say that it's as Ebola, it's something that was introduced by the government for political matter. This is very important. Uh, the second lesson learned is that uh, the, the experience from Ebola didn't work here in Guinea. We think that the Ebola, the experience that we gain from, uh, the experience that we gain from Ebola did work, work because the spread of the disease uh, was the same path, but here in Guinea, uh, the, the government is trying to find a new way how to manage, how to isolate, and how to spread. Uh, the other learner, lesson we learned is that in Africa, as I said at the beginning, after Ebola, they, 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 they identify four, four categories. In, in, in Africa, but we realize more of the country in the, the higher category still have the higher cases, like Senegalese, like uh, Ghana. Uh, we don't know what happened. So, yes, um, yes. So these are the lessons we have learned and we need to build capacity again. And, and, and what does that mean concretely? Because one of the things actually, I, and, and I'm going to say this, uh, listening to both of you, uh, for instance, people in Kenya, and I was listening to some news about Kenya, and people were saying, what do you do about the slums? How can anybody be, uh, 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 how can so anybody isolated. be quarantined, confined, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. But it turned out that in fact, confinement is actually easier in those places because the children live together, so if an adult is sick, you just drop your kids off somewhere else. In America, you can't, that, you can't do that. So we weren't even thinking about how this family structure is both a hindrance, but also of help in thinking about, about how we relate to the disease, right? And I was actually very fascinated in reading that, that obviously, yes, it's, as in Africa, it's, it's very clear. You have a problem in one family, just drop the kids off to auntie. They'll be fine. You don't even have to explain to them. Just Worry you are going to be with auntie for, for two weeks, right? So what it is, and, and, and so I'm saying that because a lot of the, 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 the uh, solution to this, this illness also implies our traditions, our culture, and, and et cetera, et cetera. So I was hoping that you would comment. When I said, what have we learned? I was hoping that you would comment on that too, because when you talk about Africa, our particularity, that's one of those things. How is social distancing and et cetera? Uh, confinement and how is going that going to affect us in the future and what should, how should our government be taking that into account in thinking about public health and th this is what i meant by saying i hope that with the pandemic we've evolved a new wave of health workers who are the ordinary citizens who know the society who know how to move around but get given the basic tools of how to adopt this and I think to, to, to address this issue, we've got to accept our own culture first. 
look, when WHO initiated the oral radiation therapy, okay, you have to have clean water. You have to have certain number of amount of salt. You have to mix it together. It was women in Bangladesh that said, we're not going to do that because a bottle of clean water costs more than they make daily. Yeah. So they had to do what? They had to innovate. And they innovated in ways that they know better. I think African countries, all of us, we have to start looking for the solution from within. And again, is the colonialism or neo colonialism that makes it difficult? Somehow people are surviving. How do you live on one dollar a day? Man, who does that? Let's just think about that for a second. But we have creative women, African women, who can make that happen. I think we have to crowdsource the solutions. And we should yeah. not be shy from it. Okay, thank you. And, and I'm going to let uh, Dr. Lua say if, a few words. And I think that we are getting toward the end and, and, and I'll let my colleague Salah uh, make a, some statement, closing statement. But I actually, before uh, 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 Dr. Lua speaks, I, I want to thank everybody. Um, I think generally public health is not just a, a medicine question. It's actually a political moral and political moral question. Yes, yes. And that, that, that yes. we actually have to think about those questions alongside the medicine. And I'm very glad that you two brought those questions to light today. And I want to thank you for that. Dr. Lua, and then I let my, my friend Salah uh, say what he has to say. Well, I will, I don't have to, to add more about what said my colleague. I will agree on that. And yes, we can, these are the, the issues that we have to work on. We have to consider our own culture. We have to assess that and what is the benefit in and what we have used to, to tackle the disease and to prevent for next so that we, we will not, uh, we will avoid a next uh, pandemic or epidemic. Uh, so social, we need our social, we, we need to evaluate our background, our culture so that we can find what we can use for next. Thank you. Thank you. I just wanted uh, to uh, say really thank you uh, to everyone, uh, Professor Odubenga, Ogedegbe uh, from New York, uh, Dr. Kovana, Marcel, Lua from Guinea, uh, Conakry, and Siba from, uh, I guess, uh, Ithaca, New York, but also Baltimore. Uh, I thank you so much for uh, uh, leading this uh, and moderating this panel, uh, Professor Siba, and for our colleagues for their intervention, thoughtful, insightful uh, observations uh, about the challenges that are, 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 are facing African societies, African nations and the responses. They were, you were very clear and, and, and also very self-critical in reflecting on this. Uh, you didn't miss word. Uh, we are grateful also for the analysis uh, that actually tackled the issue of public health um, historically uh, and rooted it in the colonial system of how diseases were studied. And I, I think that's a, a very interesting observation and how that carried into the post-colonial uh, 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 you know, situation and how dependency has been also uh, in research and in reliance on, on initiatives from abroad and in even funding research uh, and how that dictate the agenda. And that it's about time that Africans uh, put their resources together and establish institutions and ways of doing research. I'm also grateful that of exposing the structural inequalities, not just within the continent, uh, but abroad, but also thinking about it globally and how that affect the flow of medicine, of research, and of, 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 uh, of testing. So these are all very important lessons. And I'm also grateful that you also gave us thought, food for thought for the future, thinking post the pandemic. I mean, uh, uh, COVID-19 is not gonna be the last, and that it's important to think uh, uh, in a futuristic way. So uh, I thought between the two of you, uh, Dr. Ogedegbe uh, and, 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 and uh, Professor Lua too, that you really gave us, gave very practical, but also theoretical suggestions of moving forward. So thank you uh, to all of you for this wonderful uh, uh, panel.
panel and, and, and webinar, and we thank all the audiences globally, and I also thank the team of the Africa Institute for doing a wonderful job. And, and on, on behalf of the three of us, I also want to thank you for hosting us. And this has been a very, very instructive comment, and thank you to the Africa Institute. Thank you so much. We'll end thank it you. here. I hope we all meet soon in better situations. Okay, look forward to all of them. Thank you.